let us get started then. Um, this session is about workbook five. I have actually sent out to you today, and perhaps a good idea for the future, um, an advanced copy handout of the slides that I'm going to go through, so that if you have any problem seeing them on screen, you can look at the printed copies. Workbook five is on audit and control. It's not a subject that people with an accounting background like, um, because it is very much about theories and concepts rather than numbers. And we're going to talk today about five areas, the concepts of accountability, transparency and control, the independent audit, the Supreme Audit Institution or SAI, internal financial control, internal audit, and the feedback from the PFM system to policy, including parliamentary scrutiny and civil society participation. So let's start off with accountability, transparency, and control. These are three linked concepts, as I hope this diagram illustrates. Transparency says what is happening. Accountability, who is responsible for what happens. And control is control over the events and actions that are reported through transparency and for which per persons are accountable. So three interlinked concepts. And again, quite theoretical, I want to just introduce the agency theory of accountability. This is the fundamental basis of the concept of accountability. And this diagram illustrates it in both the public and the private sector. The agency theory of accountability envisages an agent. In the public sector, it's the government. In the private sector, it's the directors of a company who is accountable to, in the public sector, the citizens, in the private sector, the shareholders. So the agency theory of government is that A, the agent, is accountable to B. And it's important for government as it is for companies. Achieving accountability requires both transparency and institutional processes, such as audit, parliamentary oversight, and civil society organizations, all of which we will be talking about today. And you need these to make accountability effective. Again, if we have the agency theory on the left, the government as the agent accountable to the citizens, the government is audited by the auditor, that's the process of transparency, who prepares audit reports, which goes both to parliament and to civil society organizations. Civil society organizations is a concept I will talk more about but we are talking about the representatives of society. So these could be pressure groups um, for particular groups in society, uh, for females, for example, for children, for a particular group who live in a particular geographic area. Any civil society organization is entitled to receive audit reports and they enable citizens to make accountability effective. It's very difficult for citizens to directly affect government, but through parliament and through civil society organizations, you can make accountability effective. And we'll talk more about how these work as we go through this session today. That takes us on to, I think, transparency. Um, what is transparency? I'll look at the OECD. Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, definition of transparency. And at the bottom of that page, you'll see the web link where you can look at this in more detail. Their definition of transparency is openness towards citizens about government structure and functions, fiscal policy intentions, public sector accounts, and projections, forecasts, if you like. And it, 
transparency involves a ready access, and I'm just reading this because the words are very important, a ready access to reliable, comprehensive, timely, understandable, and internationally comparable information on government activities. That's the definition, isn't it, of financial reporting? That's what financial reporting is and should be. And going on, so that the electorate and financial markets can accurately assess the government's financial position and the true costs and benefits of government activities, including their present and future economic and social implications. Very comprehensive definition, that, of what transparency is about. And do notice that in that definition, it said the electorate, which is the citizens, and financial markets. Because, of course, in assessing the sovereign risk of a country, that will be important. The IMF doesn't actually have a, such a definition of fiscal transparency, but it does have a code of fiscal transparency, which is important. Um, it's been recently updated, and again, you've got the link at the bottom of the page so that you will look at it in more detail. The IMF Code of Fiscal Transparency is very similar to the OEC definition, but it's based, it, it's if you like a more analytic approach. It's based on four pillars which we've got here. Fiscal reporting, fiscal forecasting and budgeting, fiscal risk analysis and management, and resource revenue management. Then under those four pillars, there's detail. I'm not going to read all of these out. Um, they're well, you've got a copy of these slides and they're also in your workbook. Um, you're not expected to memorize these for the examination, but you should be aware of, you should memorize the four pillars. So if I go back, this is what you should memorize. You should understand but not memorize the detail. Let's go on from transparency to audit. We said the audit was the first element in making accountability effective, and transparency links accountability through transparency to the audit. The independent audit is carried out for a country by the country's supreme audit institution, SAI. That is the audit institution resp responsible for public sector audit. In Somaliland, it's the Auditor General who has a role defined in your constitution. And also know about INTOZAI, which stands for International Organization of Supreme Audit Institutions. This is a body on which all SAIs are represented and it sets SAI audit standards, which we will look at a little bit more. So InterSI is very important in terms of public sector audit. It is the standard setting body. Let's come back though, first of all, to the role of the SAI in the public sector. If you look at the public sector, a slightly different way of looking at it, uh, you've got the legislature, parliament, the House of Representatives in Somaliland. Um, you've got central government and you've got local government. And under that, you've got ministries, departments and agencies, and also public corporations. All of those form the public sector. And all of them are the, respons the audit responsibility of the SAI in Somaliland, again, the Auditor General. Now, in some countries, the actual audit work can be subcontracted to private sector auditors. Um, I don't think that happens in Somaliland, but it is possible. That's fine, um, but the responsibility remains with the SAI. The SAI is responsible to Parliament for the audit of the whole of the public sector. A very important role. Because the SAI is an office of the legislature. That's a technical term. An SAI is not part of the executive. If you look at your theory of government, you have your executive, your legislature, and your judiciary as the three arms of government. An SAI is part of the legislature. 
It's independent. Independence is of enormous importance to an SAI. It has the power and duty to audit government activities, including financial transactions, operations, and assets and liabilities, to publish reports, and it has professional staff who are able to make professional judgments. That's why it makes accountability effective, because the ordinary citizen is not professionally qualified. Auditors are. We said independence is of fundamental importance. There are three dimensions to independence. Um, first of all, it must have operational independence. It must have the right of access to information, documents, and to individuals. And it must be able to publish reports. It's no good having an SAI which doesn't publish its reports. The reports need to be published. It needs organizational independence, appointment, staffing, budget, relationship with other government institutions. That's often a problem. The Ministry of Finance wants to control all government expenditure, but the SAI should be independent and not under the financial control of the Ministry of Finance. Its budget should be set directly by Parliament, not by the Ministry of Finance. I do not know the arrangement in Somaliland. That's something you can talk about in your next session. How is the Auditor General in Somaliland funded and does it have financial independence? And it, there should be personal independence. Uh, there should be protection from external influence or pressure. So you don't want an Auditor General who has to do what he's told. You want an Auditor General who is independent. And you don't want a conflict of interest. Um, you don't want, for example, a political party appointing the Auditor General. That would be a conflict of interest. Those are tests that you can also apply to any country, not just Somaliland, to any country, to see how independent the Auditor General is. There are three types of audit that are carried out by an SAI. A certification audit. This is actually a relatively new concept for SAIs. Is what happens in the private sector when the annual financial statements of a company are produced, they will be audited by an independent auditor. It's sometimes called, in fact, often called a certification audit. You certify the credibility of the financial statements. And similarly, in the public sector, the Auditor General should express an opinion, certify, means the same thing on the annual financial statements of the government. Secondly, we've got what has been the traditional role of the SAI, which is the compliance audit, to ensure that the operations of government comply with laws, rules, and regulations. And thirdly, we've got the performance audit, which is audit of the performance of governments in delivering value for money, which is a very new area. Um, a lot of SAIs do not, do not carry out performance audits and it's probably important to get the first two working properly first before moving on to performance audit. Um, in the UK, our Supreme Audit Institution, referred to as the National Audit Office, regularly carries out audits of how well government is performing and producing or produces reports which are often very unpopular with government because it's completely independent and is able to do that. So performance audits are important, but they are the third stage you should get to. I haven't mentioned in here pre-audit. Um, I've had a discussion about this actually with some members of the Auditor General's office in Somaliland. The InterSci standards do allow pre-order to be carried out. That is to say, checking before a transaction takes place. However, uh, there is a problem with pre-order because it really means that the auditor is becoming involved in the operations. 
and therefore loses that independence. It would never happen in the private sector. And in general, I think that pre-audit is something that auditor general offices should be moving away from, and that should become the role of internal audit. But that's again a discussion that you could have. Let's talk a little bit more about performance audit. Um, performance audit can be seen at several levels. You've got performance audit at the policy level, uh, where sector strategies and budgets are set, and they're then turned into activities through budget execution. You then acquire inputs to carry out those activities, and you can review the, review the efficiency of acquisition of those inputs, the economy, if you like. Value is added by government to produce certain outputs, and you can review the economy and the production of those. That's the operation level. Those outputs are then turned into the execution of policies, which enables you to review effectiveness. And overall, that represents value for money audit. Easier to see with some numbers. Let's look at an example. Supposing you're a private a pilot program to improve adult literacy, and the target is to um, provide 1,000 illiterate adults with literacy training. You have a budget of $600,000, and the goal is to increase functional literacy to 60% of the target group, that is to say 600 people. So 600 out of those 1,000 should be functionally literate at the end of the program. Now let's see what actually happens when you implement that. This is a purely hypothetical example. I haven't taken it from anywhere in particular, or I'm familiar with this particular situation. First of all, actual expenditure is $500,000. You budgeted $600,000, so in econom economic terms, you're 15% below budget. You've got a 15% saving. It doesn't mean very much. It just means you haven't spent what you plan to spend. You only train 900 people. So although you spent less money, you've also trained less people. But if you work out the cost per, per person, the budget originally was $600. $500,000 spread over 900 people is $556 per person. So you've actually managed to get your training in at less than the budget cost, 7% below budget cost. Well, that's fine, but what did you achieve? Well, let us assume that at the end of this program, you have a test of functional literacy, and you find that 600 participants are rated as being functionally literate, which was your goal. So you've achieved your goal. And in terms of 1000 uh, in terms of value for money, um, the budget was to spend $1,000 for each literate person. You've actually spent $833. You can check my arithmetic, but I think that's correct. Was this value for money? There actually isn't any definite answer. You'd want to make national and international comparisons with other literacy training schemes to decide whether that was, a, whether that was good value for money. But that's the sums that you would need to go through to work out economy, efficiency, effectiveness, and value for money. And when you move into performance audit, then this is the sort of exercise that you will be going through. You're trying to relate how much you spend against budget, what you achieved against your targets, and whether that represented good value for money. The legal framework of SAIs, um, I think, can be seen as a pyramid. At the top is the Constitution, which should define, as it does in Somaliland, the institutional status and responsibilities of the SAI, the Auditor General, under which you have laws. So, again, in Somaliland, you have an Auditor General law. Then you have the standards, which will be based, or should be based, on the InterSAI standards, which we'll talk about in a minute. And under those, you have the detailed regulations and procedures on exactly how you do the audit. 
The Constitution is at the top and is narrowest because that will be a relative brief description. And as we go down through these levels, they will become more and more detailed. The relationship with the SAI, I keep coming back to citizens, to civil society at the top, because the whole of government is about delivering services to the citizens of the country. They are customers. They elect, in a democracy, the legislature, which is parliament. Under parliament, in the UK, we call it the Public Accounts Committee. It's given different names in different countries. But there will normally be a committee of the legislature, a committee of the House of Representatives, which is responsible for reviewing audit reports and the financial performance of government. And the SAI, for example, the Auditor General, will normally be appointed by Parliament, but report in detail to the Public Accounts Committee. On the audits of all levels of government, um, ministries, departments and agencies and public corporations. Back a moment. Okay. That's a question there. I will answer in a moment before we move on. Interzai. As I say, Interzai, the International Organization of Supreme Audit Institutions, is very important and it should provide the overall framework within which any SAI operates. The Interzai was formed in 1970s and in a first major meeting in Lima declared a series of seven principles which are still valid and are very important. First of all, it defined the purpose and types of audits. And it said that the audit is not in an end in itself, it's part of a control system, and its aim is to reveal deviations. And it defined types of audit, including post-audit, external audit, financial and performance audit, which we've already discussed. Independence of SAIs and its members, by members, we're talking about the directors and staff. And it said they must have functional independence, which included independence of members and officials of the SAI and financial independence. Come back to that point. Thirdly, the relationship to Parliament, Government and the Administration should be specified in the Constitution, all of which happens in Somaliland. It should have the power of access of investigation, including access to records, documents, and officials. It's important that the officers of the Auditor General can go into any government entity and demand access to information and to the staff who work there. Again, that happens in Somaliland. That's specified um, in your constitution. Um, the fifth principle is about the audit method, staff, and international exchange. Uh, and the last one is quite important. Audit should be in accordance with a self-determined program, and audit staff should have qualifications and moral integrity. Um, and also, as you'll see from five, uh, there is a clear requirement that there should be an international exchange of information, which enters I is the main body. Um, the, audit, the Supreme Audit Institution, the Auditor General, must be empowered to report at least annually to Parliament. And Seven really repeats what has already been said, but in a more general way, the audit powers of SAI should be specified in the Constitution. I think you can see from that that the way the Auditor General's office has been established in Somaliland does comply with all of those requirements. Now, Intersai has also set out audit standards for Supreme Audit Institutions. You're not expected to remember or know these in detail, but you should understand the general structure of the Intersai audit standards. 
Um, first of all, there are what are called basic postulates, which cover the applicability of standards, unbiased judgment, public accountability, management and responsibility, and the promulgation of standards. Then on the right, consistency, internal controls, access to data, activities to be ordered, improving audit techniques, and conflict of interest. And when you look at Intozai website and you look at the audit standards, you will find that each of these is described in detail. Then underneath these, we have a series of detailed standards, general standards, field standards, and reporting standards. Now, I'm not going to go through and read every one of these out, nor are you expected to remember these. But you should understand that InterSci audit standards are structured in the way indicated in this diagram. A set of basic postulates, and then general field and reporting standards. You should look at the InterSci website. You now have access in the learning management system to a new section called Resources. And in that section, there are links to many important organizations and documents, including Intersci. So you should follow those links to Intersci and read in more detail about it. But for the purpose of this examination, you do not need to know any more than is covered in the workbook. Now, this last point, I don't think is of great concern to you, but it's something that you ought to understand by way of background. There are actually four different ways that you can organize an SAI, all of which are operated in different countries around the world. Um, in much of Europe, other than the United Kingdom, the approach is what is called quasi-judicial. The Supreme Audit Institution is actually a court and you talk about the court of auditors. That's actually the approach that's used in most of the French former colonies in Africa, as well as in France, um, Belgium, Spain, many countries in Europe use that sort of approach. Secondly, there's the collegiate approach, um, which is a bit difficult to describe really, but it's the approach that's used in Holland, in the Dutch approach, and the German approach. Um, I don't think we need to go into it in any detail. Uh, government department, that's quite unusual, but Sweden uses that. Um, in Sweden, the Auditor General is a department of government, but they have actually still got arrangements which preserve the independence of the Supreme Audit Institution. So it does actually work. And Finally, you have the model that you have in Somaliland and is in use in the UK and USA, where the auditor, Supreme Audit Institution is an independent audit entity. I think you just need to be aware that there are these different approaches. They all work and they are all tending to converge so that in practice they all operate in much the same way. Now, I'll just deal with the question that I've got here from Hamse Farah. Um, are auditor generals allowed in other countries to audit institutions outside government budget, such as local NGOs who get funds directly from the donors or NGOs? Well, the answer is that, yes, it does happen in some countries. The point is that if the organizations receive funds from some donor, that is effectively money that is there for the benefit of the country. And therefore, it is perfectly reasonable for an SAI to be asked to audit that organization. And it does happen in some countries. It is a matter of the policy and decision of the individual country whether or not that happens. But there is certainly um, many examples where that does happen. I'm now trying to think of a particular country where that does happen. Um, certainly in South Asia it happens, in Nepal and Bangladesh, for example, it happens. I'm not so sure about examples in Africa, but I'm sure there are some. Okay, let's go on to internal financial control. Oh, 
what do we mean by internal financial control? Well, the definition that I've got here is a process affected by an entity's legislative body, management and other personnel designed to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of the objectives in the following categories. Effectiveness and efficiency of operations, reliability of financial reporting and compliance with applicable laws and regulations. Notice this is internal financial control. This is not internal audit. This is the controls that you establish in an organization. What are we actually talking about when we talk about internal financial control? Uh, well, you know, an example would be um, pre-audit. And pre-audit is really part of internal financial control, where one person checks documents before, say, a payment is made to ensure that they comply with all of the requirements. But that's financial. It's more than that. It's about control over your assets to make sure, for example, that you don't lose assets. Um, that if a government purchases a motor vehicle, that motor vehicle remains the property of the public sector entity until it is sold by that entity. And you have control to make sure that you can always account for that motor vehicle and the use of the vehicle. Internal financial control is very important. It's a responsibility of the entity's management. And what you want is reasonable assurance. You can never be absolutely sure. It is always impossible to make sure that nothing happens to that motor vehicle. It is never used improperly. But you want reasonable assurance that it is unlikely to be used improperly. And with internal control, you've always got a balance of the cost of the control against the risk of some sort of loss. And there are five components of internal control, the control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and monitoring. Now, internal control is a big subject area. Um, it's an important subject area. It's one that you will be looking at in considerably more detail during the SIPFA IPFM course. So we're not going to go into it in any great detail here, but I do want to talk about this concept of risk management. Risk management is a process where you identify and assess potential risk events. You manage and monitor risks. What is risk? Well, in our terms, it's the possibility of outcomes being worse than expected. Our risk is normally used in everyday sense in terms of the risk of being killed um, in a road accident, for example. We're talking about something less dramatic than that in business management or public sector management. We're talking, for example, the risk that you may predict that you will receive um, an income of $1,000 from a certain type of tax, but you only receive $800. That's a risk. And that's what we're really talking about, is risks at that sort of financial level. In order to understand and manage risks, the first thing you want to have is some method of categorizing them. And you can categorize risks on two scales, the impact of the risk event occurring and the likelihood of it occurring. And we could look at four different points within this scale, these two scales. First thing is high impact, high likelihood risks. Um, for example, uh, when you have our uh, program, for example, to train people in literacy. Um, there's very likely going to be a problem of getting people to attend the training program. We actually saw in our example that only 900 rather than the predicted 1,000 attended the program. Um, obviously, people not attending has a big impact and is very likely to occur. At the other end of the scale, we've got risks which have very little impact and are also very unlikely to occur. Um, it may be that when people attend the training program, they drink two cups of coffee instead of the one you'd allowed for in your expenses. It doesn't happen very often. It doesn't really matter very much anyway. And then 
we've got the other two boxes, high impact risks, but which are very unlikely. Um, for example, the risk that during your training program, a meteor will land on the training center and kill everybody. Um, it would have a big impact, but it's very unlikely. And on the other hand, things that have a very low impact, but are very likely to occur, um, you know, such as people having to leave the room to make telephone calls and this type of thing. So you can categorize all of your risks using this sort of scale. And you can use that as a part of a matrix to manage risks. The first thing you've got to do is to identify the risks. Now, normally, you don't try to identify every possible risk, such as people drinking two cups of coffee, because it's too minor to worry about. You will normally focus on, quite commonly, the top 10 risks. What could go wrong? How likely is it to occur? What's the probability of the risk event occurring? And what will be the impact, number three, what will be the impact if the risk occurs? And then importantly, in managing risk, what mitigation action can you take to mitigate the risk? Is it worth the expenditure? So if I come back to our example of the meteor dropping on the training room, there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, short of having some space program, I think there was a film recently, well, there was a, a sort of rocket sent a nuclear bomb to blow a meteor off course. Um, it's hardly worth the expenditure because the risk is so unlikely to occur. So you've got to, in your mitigation actions, look at what you can do to mitigate the risk and is that mitigation worth the expenditure? It obviously depends on the type of expenditure. I mean, if you're talking about people's lives, then you will want to spend a lot more money to mitigate the risk than if you're talking about some minor financial loss. And then finally, you need a monitoring system so that you can monitor and track the management of the risk. So as the program goes on, um, are the risk events occurring? Is your mitigation action working? Do you need to do something more? In most programs and projects, you do need a risk management structure to identify the risks and know what you will do about them. It doesn't necessarily need to be very formal, but it does need to be there. And you'll see that more and more these days, that people are demanding um, that there is a risk assessment carried out before some activity takes place. So we are getting much better at identifying and managing risks. But we must recognize that there are foreseeable and unforeseeable risks. This is really not something you need to know about for this program, but I put it in here because I think it is something that's important and of interest. Foreseeable risks are risks of an event occurring. For example, um, if you are working in India and there's unusually heavy monsoon rain on the upper reaches of the Ganges, you know that within a few months there will be flooding on the lower Ganges. It's a known risk. You know about it. You can predict how likely that heavy rain is and how likely the risk of flooding is. It's a totally foreseeable risk. The other type of risk are unforeseeable risks. Um, I put in brackets this term black swan. I'm not going to explain that in any detail, but there was a very well-known book called Black Swan written by Hassan Taleb, uh, an Iranian economist, on unforeseeable risks. And his argument was that there are risks which you just don't know that they're going to happen. Uh, you might be able to recognize them in hindsight, but in advance, you just don't know that they're there. For example, the financial crises of 2008 was not foreseen. People did not foresee that as a risk. The collapse of major banks in the USA and the United Kingdom was not foreseen. Now, by their nature, you cannot predict or manage unforeseeable risks, but you must recognize that they do exist and may occur. Um, and with hindsight, of course, all risks can be foreseen. So after the 2007-8 financial crisis, many commentators 
will then say, oh, we could see these in advance if only we'd thought about it. The point is you didn't think about it. Um, so beware of hindsight. I say it's not part of the syllabus for this course, but it is, I think, an important concept um, and something that you should be aware of. Risk and internal control. Internal control involves risk management, identifying and managing risk. And we're talking about the risks of control failures. Um, so that there may, for example, be theft because you haven't controlled something. Risk of management failures. Manage, management may fail to manage something properly or the actual risk of loss or theft. So internal control is very much about managing these sort of risks. Let's go on now to talk about internal audit. Now, I know internal audit is a subject of interest in Somaliland because it was going to be in the PFMA, but I understand that it's no longer there, although it may be added later on. So we need to understand what we mean by internal audit. Internal audit is, and this is the definition of the International Internal Audit Association, an independent objective assurance and consulting activity designed to add value and improve an organization's operations. Internal audit helps an organization accomplish its objectives. And internal audit is part of the management process and should be controlled by managers. Now this is important because internal audit is very often misunderstood and wrongly applied. Internal audit is not internal audit by the Ministry of Finance of other ministries. That's just another form of external audit. Internal audit is carried out by individual ministries themselves. They manage it and it reports to the management of that ministry. Nor is it just about money. It's about the whole business, the whole process of a particular public sector entity. And that becomes clear when we talk about the types of audit. We mentioned three types of audit, certification audit, compliance audit, and performance audit. Internal audit provide, will carry out compliance audit and performance audit. It does not carry out a certification audit on the accounts. Whereas an external auditor can perform all three of those types of audit. An internal auditor cannot certify the accounts because he's not independent, because he's part of the management and reports to the management of the entity. And again, a nice three-dimensional model of internal audit. Internal audit applies at all levels of government, central, subnational, and local levels, depending on the particular structure of a country. It should be supported by a code of ethics, standards, practice and advisories, development and practice aids. So there should be support to the proper process of internal audit, which can be provided centrally. So you can and probably should have a unit in, say, the Ministry of Finance, providing these support services to the internal auditors in individual ministries. They don't control the auditors' internal ministries, but they support them. And its roles are assurance and consulting. There are internal audit standards. They're issued by the Institute of Internal Auditors. And they're divided into attribute standards, performance standards, and implementation standards. At this stage in your course, you do not need to be familiar with these. Again, as part of the CIFA course, you will look in more detail at internal audit. This is a comparison, in fact, of internal and external audit and internal control. External audit is performed by an SAI, which reports to Parliament. It reports on public sector entities. It carries out certification, compliance and performance audit, and it takes account of internal controls and internal audit. And that's important because one of the things that you should do as an external auditor is you should look at the internal controls and internal audit, and that will affect how much work you need to do. If there's very good internal controls and internal audit, 
It means the external auditor can reduce the amount of detailed checking. You can rely on the good systems and controls within an organization. Internal control, the bottom left box, is the responsibility of entity management and its objective to ensure the entity performs in accordance with the objective is to ensure the entity performs in accordance with the entity goals, which is a very general statement, but it's basically made there to help management. Internal audit is performed by an internal auditor appointed by and responsible to management of the entity. And it reports to the entity management and it can carry out compliance and performance audit. I think that little diagram is very important because it does summarize quite concisely these three different concepts and what each does. And to emphasize this reporting responsibility, external audit reports to the ultimate owner, the legislature, and must be independent. Internal auditor reports to senior management and it cannot be independent. Now notice that it cannot be independent since it is part of management. So internal audit by definition is not, nor should it be independent. It is part of management. Right, the last of the areas I want to talk about today is a very important one, which we're really just introducing in this course, which is the whole feedback loop. We've gone all the way through the financial management, the PFM cycle, um, from budget preparation, budget execution, accounting, reporting, um, auditing. How does that feed back into what governments do? And I want to particularly talk about two examples of how this can work. And notice these were in our diagram of making accountability effective. So it really completes that part of the program as well. Um, parliamentary scrutiny. Now I'll use UK as an example because I do not know or understand what happens in Somaliland. I haven't found anything on this. So I'll talk about what happens in the UK. In the UK, we have a public accounts committee, which is a committee of parliament, equivalent of your House of Representatives. The public accounts committee can, consists of members of parliament, MPs. It meets and it reviews audit reports received from the Supreme Audit Institution. And then it will call ministers and officials to answer questions. Now, that's really important power. So it can have a meeting which will be a public meeting on television and ministers and officials will have to come before it and answer questions on how they've performed, why certain things have done, what has gone wrong. And they then issues reports. It is a very powerful committee. Many officials are terrified of being called before the Public Accounts Committee because it could completely affect their career. It's a very good example of parliamentary scrutiny and it is very effective. In some countries, there's the equivalent of the Public Accounts Committee and it meets, but nobody takes any notice of it. Um, this is a matter of the way Parliament and these committees operate in different countries. Uh, we cannot prescribe uh, how different countries operate, but that's what a public accounts committee should be and do. And all, the third or final component of this, or a second component, is civil society participation. Civil society is a term given to the citizens of the country, not just the electorate. It includes those who don't have voting rights, such as children. It's all of the citizens of a country. And they are represented by civil society organizations. These could include NGOs, but not just NGOs. Um, the press, for example, the media is in effect a civil society organization. Civil society organizations will represent, I've spoken about this before, 
they'll represent particular um, groups within society. Uh, they could be groups defined by gender, by ability or disability, um, by geographic area, by caste or tribal loyalties, or by some particular interest. You might have a group that is very interested, for example, in um, exploration of the moon. A bit unlikely, but possible. And they have a particular interest that they form a society. That's a civil society organization. They will then try and persuade the government of Somaliland to invest money in moon landing. I, must say I hope they're unsuccessful, but it is quite possible. They would be a civil society organization. And they should be presented, all of these organizations, with the opportunity to participate in the budget setting and budget execution. Now, this is a very new area, a very new concept. Many governments, and particularly public sector officials, dislike the concept. They think they should tell people what to do. Civil society participation is actually saying, no, we are the citizens of the country. You should do what we want you to do. And how could we make that effective? And there are opportunities for civil society participation. Um, there is, incidentally, something called the budget project. And again, it's one of the links you've got on your learning management system, which has documented various examples of civil society participation around the world of how these can work. These are just some ideas from this. First of all, at the budget level, if the budget documents are published in advance, for example, the fiscal strategy and the principles of resource allocation, then people have got a chance to have a say. Um, for example, you might they might say, well, we actually think that you should reduce taxation and hand the money back to the people to decide how they spend it, or the other way around. They might say, well, we actually think you should invest money in setting up a space program so we can land on the moon. The more you publish documents in advance, the more you give opportunity for debate, the more you give opportunities for civil society participation. And it's not just when you prepare the budget, but how the budget is executed. Very often, what's in the budget, of what happens, is quite different. Um, I don't know what, how it works in Somaliland, but in one country, in Nepal, where I've worked, um, projects will put in the budget to keep civil society organizations and politicians happy. So it's, ah, we have in the budget um, a amount of money assigned for moon exploration. But the officials who have the actual responsibility for organizing expenditure simply don't spend any money in that area. They simply don't make any money available. So you need some form of participation, not just the budget setting, but the budget execution. Accounting and reporting provides great opportunities for civil society participation because here you have the information of what has actually happened in your financial and audit reports. Um, those should be publicly available. People can comment on them. It is obviously ex post. It's after the event, but it can influence what happens in the future. Okay, that brings me to the end of this particular presentation. I'm going to stop the recording now, but I will ask for any questions. Uh, what I will answer before I stop, uh, differentiate internal control and internal audit. Let me go back through my slides. I think this is probably the best way of differentiating between them. Internal controls are about the controls that are established in an organization. They're not about a group of people who do it. It's about the whole organization. Internal audit is a particular function within the organization. Um, if you need any more explanation, I'll be happy to give it, but I think that really is it. Okay, I'll stop the recording at this stage.
I will deal with any more questions afterwards.